Hello, this lecture is on the Song of Solomon. This is a most wonderful book, and as we open the Bible, which is the inspired Word of God, where we find the Song of Solomon, we need to bow our heads to thank God for this book and to ask him to guide us in our study. So I bow my head, and Heavenly Father, we thank thee for the words of your Holy Scripture. We know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for many things, for our correction and for our instruction in righteousness. We ask that in this lecture, the beauties of this book may come forth with all of its symbolic meaning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Song of Solomon is a most wonderful book. It is written in the language of symbolism, and there it, it is so complicated because it is an historical prophetic book. It, it, it cannot be um, used by putting an interpretation upon it. No human being could possibly put his own private interpretation upon this book and get the true meaning from it. The only way that this book can be studied is by going by the Isaiah principle, line upon line, here a little, there a little. The only way this book can be studied is to take it verse by verse, word by word, look up the Hebrew meanings of the words, and trace those Hebrew words all through the entire Old Testament, and also as those words are used comparably in the Greek. And it requires both Old and New Testament to be able to give this book its proper meaning. And I did spend about five months doing that kind of work on the, on the book. And what came forth was most delightful. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. What it, this book is a prophetic history of God's people. Uh, the, that is the bride, the church, the bride, from the first coming of Jesus to his second coming. Now, this Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, has actually uh, been a part of the sacred canon, or the inspired scriptures, all through the time of the prophets. It was written about uh, a thousand years before Jesus was born by uh, King Solomon, and that's verified in the Mount of Blessings, um, page 49, where it says, the divine beauty of the character of Christ, of whom the noblest and most gentle among men are but a reflection, of whom Solomon, by the spirit of inspiration, wrote, He is the chiefest among ten thousand, yea, he is altogether lovely. That's quoting from the Song of Songs. And this book is really a revelation of Jesus Christ and his church, his bride. And just like the book of Revelation, it is a revelation of Jesus, so we are going to find that there are many references to the book of Revelation in the symbolism. The same symbol symbols that are used in the Song of Solomon are also used over in Revelation and in other parts of the scripture. The book was uh, known uh, as the first of the five scrolls of the Megaloth, a group of small books placed between Job and Daniel in the third division of the Ketubim of the Hebrew Bible. Now, I'm saying that we can look up all this kind of information in the encyclopedias, such as the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia and other, the Interpreter's Bible Commentary. There are many commentaries that have given comments on this book, but it requires the, the uh, comprehensive study line upon line, line upon line, in order to bring forth its inspired gems of truth. The correct title is found in the very first uh, chapter and in the very first verse. And as we turn to it here, what I see in this uh, beautiful book is that the title is, verse 1, The Song of Songs. Now, the translators called it the Song of Solomon because Solomon, they said, wrote it. But actually, the true title is the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Now, that is 
a Hebrew idiom. If, like, for example, king of kings, which means the greatest king of all kings. It has to do with lord of lords or hol most holy of holies, so, or which is called most holy place of the sanctuary. Song of songs, therefore, means the greatest song, the most beautiful song of any song that has ever been written. So it is very worthy of our study. And this, uh, the title Song of Songs, declares the book to be a superlative expression of Holy Scripture. It's in its poetry, it is superlative. In its literary composition and expression, in its aesthetic beauty, in its historic scope, in its prophetic imagery, and its revelations of the exalted character and titles and offices of Jesus Christ, it is a superlative book of expressions, and only the Lord God himself could have given it to us. Now, how did the Jews use the book? That's very important that we look at the way the Jews used it so that we will know how it is to be used in our day. Uh, I'll read from the encyclopedias that tell us how the Jews used it. The Song of Songs is read in the synagogue during the liturgical year, and it is read on Passover time. And it also says that it was written in the 8th century, and the song was used liturgically beginning to be read on the 8th day of the Passover celebration at the beginning of the new year. This custom harks back to time immemorial. So we know that the Jews used it on the feast of the Passover. Now, what was the significance of the Passover? That we need to understand. Uh, I'm reading now from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 277, where it says the Passover was to be both commemorative, that is, it was uh, remembering things that had happened in the past history of Israel, and typical, not only pointing back to the deliverance from Egypt, but forward to the greater deliverance which Christ was to accomplish in freeing his people from the bondage of sin. So it had great significance to the Jews who had been delivered from Egypt, and it has great significance to us in our day because it points forward to the deliverance from sin. It is a song of deliverance. Now, in Egypt, at the time of the deliverance there, there were three deliverances. There was the deliverance from the bondage of slavery, there was deliverance from the death angel that passed over the houses, and there was also deliverance at the Red Sea. Three great deliverances. So today, we know that there are three great deliverances which Christ will accomplish for his people. There is, first of all, the deliverance from sin. And the